success. Okay. Hey everyone, we're just gonna give it another minute for people to log on. Perfect, we might go ahead and get started. Um, so to kick things off, I'm just gonna pass it over to Owen, who's a fellow board member to go over a few Zoom etiquette rules. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Owen. I am one of the co-undergraduate delegates. Um, for today's lecture, just a quick reminder that uh, we would like for all of you to please be muted during the presentation. Uh, you are invited and welcome to turn on your cameras and please rename yourselves to reflect any universities or organizations that um, you would like to show off. And lastly, please leave any questions in the chat and at the end of our presentation, I will run through them and um, we'll just give it a couple more minutes. Perfect, thanks Owen. Um, welcome again to everyone to the Wilderness Med Educational Lecture Series. Um, ooh, how do I hit next? There we go. Um, if you haven't already, feel free to give us a follow on social media, stay up to date on all things GOMI. You can also check out the website. We have old lectures archived on there and that's the place to head to if you want to register for upcoming talks as well. Um, so here at GOMI, our mission is to create an educational platform where interested students and healthcare professionals can explore and interact with wilderness and emergency medicine. Um, we're working to showcase different spheres in which physicians and healthcare professionals can make an impact and inspire others to think abstractly about the ways in which we can utilize our careers in healthcare and medicine. And finally, to create an international community of wilderness medicine enthusiasts and experts committed to promoting a diverse and culturally competent environment. Um, we have a lot more really cool talks coming up. So again, you can go to the website to register for those. And without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce today's speaker, Dr. Dan Lack. Uh, Dr. Lack is family medicine registrar in Los Angeles, Tasmania, and currently teaching faculty with the University of Tasmania in the Expedition Medicine Section. He's a part of the Australian Ski Patrol Medical Advisory Committee medical officer for the Ben Lomond Ski Patrol in Tasmania. He also has had a 20-year career in climate change research with the field work in remote areas of the world, in addition to a 10-plus year career in mountain rescue with the Rocky Mountain Rescue Group in Boulder, Colorado. 10 years as their training doctor, mission leader, and chairperson of Rocky Mountain region of the Mountain Rescue Association. So please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Dr. Dan Black. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the invite. Um, and it's good to be here. I'm just going to open things up and see if we can get things shared properly. Um, so it's good to be here. Um, I've got a list of, of the things, the affiliations that I'm with at the moment, not to not necessarily to uh, to show off, but to give you a, a, an, an example or a range of the experiences that have gone into the topic today. Um, which is um, psychology involved in wilderness medicine. Um, so after most, most of my experience came uh, through the mountain rescue work in Colorado and after probably 600 or more mountain rescues, um, I realized that uh, there was mostly a psychological game to, to make sure there was successful rescues. Um, so in this, uh, in this topic, we're talking about stress, um, that uh, stress that um, is, is uh, built up in the environments we're working on. I'm actually just trying to move my uh, slide forward. Here we go. So I just wanna play this short video clip. Some of you may have seen it, but we go out into the wilderness because it's a beautiful place, mountains, rivers, snow. Sometimes stress can increase. Um, so if, if there's anyone out there whose, whose stress levels have not gone up by, uh, by watching this video, um, then you're, you're a much calmer person than I am. Um, but as I've, um, 
as you can see in that video, things can change pretty quickly. That guy was uh, pretty lucky uh, to, to not have a more stressful day than he did. Um, so um, we're talking about we're talking about stress. Now I need to move through to the next slide. All right. There we go. So stress, it's what makes us get stuff done. Um, many of you some may have seen uh, an example or, or a, a, of, of this slot, sort of slide, but in the mornings we wake up, our stress levels aren't that, uh, aren't that elevated. We get out of bed things start moving, we become focused, we're able to uh, start performing our duties of the day. If we need to increase that stress level or increase our ability to get stuff done, um, our stress levels go up um, and we can peak in our stress to, to have our optimum performance. But then usually we come back down to a, a, a lower level. Um, if we're stuck up in that red section of stress uh, for too long, we can, we can actually um, become injured in a psychological sense. Um, so um, our journey today is going to incorporate that sort of traffic light system um, and models of psychological care, um, but I'm going to do it with five uh, wilderness medical incidents that I've been involved in. So we'll get through it through those one at a time, and then I'm going to discuss why the psychology was the critical component of the care provided uh, in those um, in those incidents. So I'm mostly going to gloss over the physical medicine um, so we can concentrate on the psychology stuff. Um, and as I said, how it's going to, how it fits into models of psychological first aid. And if I've got a little bit of time, I'm going to have a, a very quick discussion on, on a, a, a very um, uh, topical and um, uh, very, very good sort of pathway to be able to practice some of this um, psychological uh, sort of skills. So as I was saying, we've got, um, we all go out into the wilderness for various reasons. Um, I absolutely love being in the mountains. As, I, as was mentioned, I've had a, long, had a long career with the Rocky Mountain Rescue Group. Um, and that came about by, by just deciding I wanted to spend more time in the wilderness. Um, so, um, so love, love being up in the mountains. This is a trip to uh, Peru with the uh, University of Colorado group. Um, and then I do some work for an um, uh, adventure travel company. This is a trip to China. So we're out in these beautiful places, but sometimes things can go wrong. Um, and um, when things go wrong in the wilderness, we've got so many more dimensions that we need to consider. And so... There is a number of models of psychological first aid. This is one developed by uh, a, a psychologist in Australia called Dr. Kate Bashir. Um, we all love acronyms in medicine. This one um, is the Dr. ACE model. Um, so running through this really, really quickly, um, D is always for danger in, in, uh, from what I've seen. So in any situation where we have a physical or a psychological trauma, we need to establish a bit of safety. Um, R, reduce chaos. Basically, I needed, a, a, a needed something that started with R. So reducing chaos uh, in the initial situation is, um, is important. And then um, making an assessment of the individual that's, uh, that's been affected, the environment that, that you're in, and the group that's around you. And then communicating and connecting with the people that are there. And uh, then comes this establishing calm, making, making the whole situation as calm as possible. And finally, evaluating the need for an evacuation. Um, and then there's another E on the end there, which is everything else. Once you get out of the wilderness, there's, a, there's more follow-up that would be needed, you know, if you have ongoing trauma um, related to it. So this model that I've put up here, a very, very brief introduction, um, but, but we're going to come back to that over each of the scenarios. So the first one is in the Royal Arch Trail in Boulder, uh, Colorado. It's a, it's a trail very close to town. Um, it's not a very difficult trail. Um, the incident that happened was in the middle of winter, um, uh, very close to sunset. There was snow in the forecast and a lady had taken a fall, broken her ankle, um, and she was in severe pain. She had two friends with her um, and she was completely inconsolable. So she was scared about how, would she, how she was going to get out of there. They were all getting cold. She was embarrassed. And she was saying some, some things that were a little bit extreme, um, saying that 
to her friends that she, they should just leave her there to, to stay on the trail and, and basically, you know, uh, uh, basically die. Um, so for the rescue, um, they called 911. Um, we had about 15 mountain rescuers and some other crew, so a total of 20. When all those rescuers got there, um, she was she she was even more inconsolable. She couldn't be assessed. She couldn't be treated. She couldn't be evacuated. Even though for most most people in medicine, a broken ankle, um, you know, you should be able to manage that reasonably well, even without a rescue team. Um, so the uh, the issue here was um, sorry. I'm just uh, getting rid of a few things on my screen here. Um, so. The, uh, the issue here was that she couldn't be assessed, treated or evacuated uh, properly because of her, her psychological state. When I got there, I was just chatting with one of my colleagues and as soon as she heard my Australian accent, um, she was totally fine. She had had a gap year in Australia 20 years before um, and it was the best year of her life. So all of a sudden she had something else to focus on. She became calm, collected, we were able to get the job done. And so my job for the entire rescue was to just throw on a thick Australian accent and tell stories. Um, and uh, so usually I would dive into the technical work, um, maybe a little bit of basic medical work, but this time my job was to uh, was just to talk. And so if we go over the psychology of this, I'm gonna start off each one of these scenarios with talking about red flags um, in the psychological sense. Um, and this one, this patient's reaction didn't really seem to be in reason to the event. For her, her it may well have been, but over in overall, the, the grand scheme of things, um, it, it was a pretty extreme reaction. And so if the patient's reactions is not within reason to the event, then you need, there's, there's an overlay of psychological concern that you really need to address. And so you need to put that as your primary, uh, one of your primary um, cares. Um, in this situation, it's absolutely essential to have one person to make an individual correct uh, connection. So that can be a physical touch, uh, eye contact, and as with everything in medicine, uh, don't be creepy about it. Um, making, uh, engaging in personal stories uh, and providing detailed and simple explanations on the process that's happening um, and dedicate one person to the patient. And you just got to remember that for some people who find themselves in uh, situations in the wilderness, they may not have a lot of experience. They may not understand how weather changes. They may not understand how uh, things are going to, um, uh, how things might evolve. So it can be a very scary thing. And then one interesting aspect of this is related to the pain. We all know that pain is related, is a physical stimuli that combines with our processing in the brain. Um, and it's well known to be impacted by cognitive um, interventions. So in the wilderness, we may not have all of the analgesia that we would like to give, but we do have the ability to, uh, to implement cognitive interventions. And so this is a, a very significant, um, uh, a, a good tool to be able to pull out at times uh, to, to, to um, provide a little bit more pain relief. So. If we go back to our psychological first aid model, in this situation, you're doing an assessment of the individual's reactions. Um, and that assessment is, is an important, very important first step. And then obviously communication and connection here is, is essential. So making a connection with that person um, allows them to focus on something that's, uh, that's not quite, uh, you know, that's, that's not just the injury or not just the trauma that they've experienced. So making those assessments, making those connections is, um, is really important. Okay, so moving on to our second one, this is up in the Forest Lakes on the Continental Divide, um, west, of, um, west of Boulder. Um, it's this guy who was skiing in the middle of uh, summer, some, some summer skiing on the couloirs, and he took a, took a fall, ended up hitting uh, the rock that you see off to the, uh, the right of the photo ended up down between the rock and the snow. He broke his femur. Um, he, his life was saved by his helmet um, and um, ended up calling for rescue. So it was early afternoon and an absolutely beautiful day, high up in the mountains. And he had, as I said, he had taken a fall with one ski partner that was stuck in the Bergschrund, that area between the rock and the snow. It was two hours until that area would be shaded and four hours until dark. They didn't have any gear to survive the night, but enough for backcountry touring during the day. And it was about two miles um, to out to the trailhead. 
So the rescue itself, they called 911. They got, they got through. They said they needed uh, rescue where they were. And coincidentally, there was about 25 rescuers about two miles away for another backcountry skiing, which turned out to be a fatality. Um, and But only two people in that group had snow climbing equipment um, because it was, you know, th there wasn't a lot of snow left uh, in that season. So when I was one of those people, when I got there with one of my mates, um, this patient was cold, he was wet, he was in pain, and his friend and he were stuck in this sort of rock snow cave. And it was about 600 feet of 50 degrees of hard snow to get up to them. It was difficult terrain. It was shaded. So the snow was starting to, to ice up um, and a, 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 it was going to be a huge evacuation. Um, and the patient needed to be removed from the wet, the cold and, you know, lots of, lots of physical medicine care was needed and his friend would need assistance down. So if we, in the psychology, the most important psychological aspect of this mission, this rescue, was that myself and my friend, when we first got there, we spent five minutes talking with this patient and his friend, saying that we were basically going to be ignoring them for the next 20 minutes. We needed to build anchors for ourselves to be safe. We needed to get ourselves warm, hydrated. We needed to get fueled up. Um, and we needed to do an assessment of the situation we were in and communicate with our fellow rescuers. And interestingly, six months after the rescue, we caught up with the patient and he basically said, I knew I was going to be totally fine because you guys spent the first half an hour taking care of yourselves. Um, and so that, that lesson didn't come home to me. It was something that myself and my friend did, I guess, instinctively, but it was a very, very good lesson in, um, in, in uh, utilizing psychology to help in the rescue. And so a red flag in this situation would be a, a, a rescuer or a medical pers person not um, taking care of their own health and safety. Um, you really need to do that because you don't, you don't want to create a second victim. Um, you don't want to drain resources away from the person that you're trying to help in the wilderness. And so you've got to be honest with the patient. In that situation, we said, we're going to be ignoring you for a while. You know, just, just hang out. We'll get to it. And setting the example, if you turn up as a medical professional, if you identify yourself as a doctor, people are going to take a big sigh of relief and, and thank their lucky stars that they've got help. If you believe that you can be of assistance, then you've got to own that um, and you've got, to, you've, got to, um, you've got to show that example, set that example of how things are going to go. Um, so again, this is a, an assessment of not, not of the patient, but of the people around you, uh, of the group that you've got obviously taking care of the dangerous danger situations, but also communicating verbal communication and nonverbal communication. Um, it can, the communication can take, the, can take many, many forms. So, all right. So if this photo doesn't stress some of you out uh, again, like the video at the start, then you, you better, better, better uh, uh, people than, than I am. Um, even living in Australia for quite a, uh, you know, 30 years of my 40, 40 years, um, snakes still stress me out. There was an incident that I was involved in um, a few years ago now, you know, in Western New South Wales at a rock climbing area um, where um, another a, a person in another party was bitten by a snake. And so this, this rock climbing area was about two hours uh, a walk from the campsite and about a three hour drive to the nearest hospital no coverage for phones. He was bitten on the, on the forearm when he was preparing to climb. He was sticking his hand into a, a rocky area and got bitten. There was obvious puncture marks. It was a brown snake um, about a meter long. And so the safe assumption in Australia is that it's venomous. Um, the climber, the person who was bitten, as you can well imagine, was freaking out. Um, probably a reasonable response. Um, um, no, probably not out of... Um, out of, out of um, character for what you you might expect but he was he was pretty uh pretty upset about the whole situation so he's you know really freaking out and so the treatment for this um, uh, the physical medicine here is a pressure mobilization immediately um that's for uh, all snakes in australia uh, not necessarily true for for, uh, for some snakes in other regions um but this is a situation where i was very sort of active in saying yes that we need to do something quickly um and so we have you know i was i was looking at him directly in the in the eyes 
saying, we need to get this bandage on you. This is the first aid treatment. Um, got him into the shade, sat him down. And then the next phase of this was all psychological. So for the, the outcome of this, he was evacuated by helicopter three and a half hours later. He survived, didn't need any antivenom. Um, and so the psychology behind this, after that first initial physical medicine treatment, um, the most important part is to calm the person at the scene. So in this, in this situation, knowledge of how envenomation works for the particular area you're, you're in um, is important. So the majority of, of snake bites in Australia are dry bites or they inject a small amount of venom. The, meta, the venom spreads by lymphatic flow. So if you calm everything down and use compression, you're going to minimize the, the exposure of the body, uh, the rest of the body to, to the venom. And most hospital protocols are a watch and wait. You, you just, you, you monitor bloods, you monitor their vital signs. Um, and if there's evidence of envenomation, then you go for the, the anti-venom. So sitting in place and waiting for rescue in this situation is, was, is the best option. Um, you don't want people can, you know, getting up and running down the trail. Um, so the, in that situation, you need to calm that person. We needed to calm that person down. We needed to have, give some sort of slow explanations of why that was the best situation to be, uh, to be the best treatment, the best option. And then also the person that I sent down the trail to call for help needed to have, you know, needed some sort of coaching on, you know, on, on what to say to the people, you know, to the emergency services who are going to responding. So um, there's a little bit of psychology involved in that as well. Like being confident, you know, we've got this under control. Here's the coordinates. Here's our current treatment. Here's our plan. Um, and uh, just, just, you know, sh showing that, uh, that that calmness has come over that this scene it was really, really important. Um, so red flags in this situation, um, pretty much all Australian snakes are red flags. Um, as I was saying, it's essential to have the knowledge of what the treatment is and to be able to explain it, to be able to uh, share it with people in simple, calm um, uh, talking points. And as I mentioned, I think most people would be freaking out in this situation. So how do you create calm? Um, I like to use the phrase that the, the hand of God on the shoulder, um, um, you know, a very distinct, uh, very firm shoulder, a hand onto the shoulder, making eye contact and using some very, very simple words. And again, if you've identified yourself as, as a doctor or a medical person, if you've got that wilderness experience, utilizing that um, confidence you have in that situation can be really, really helpful. Being honest, again, is important. And future-oriented discussion is also important for, for people in this situation, um, making discussions about, you know, in this situation, where's, you know, wh what else do you want to climb? Where, where, what, other, what other rock climbs? What other crags have you got on your plans? You know, where do you want to travel to? Um, and creating calm by guided breathing. Um, there's a really good book, which I'll give a reference to at the end, um, which um, basically shows that there's some significant research that shows that breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth, five and a half seconds in, five and a half seconds out, five and a half breaths a minute, five and a half liters a minute is this optimum spot to minimize, um, minimize the stress, to, to activate the, that vagal, uh, vagal tone to, to, to create as much calm as possible. So again, more preparation um, in terms of the knowledge that we need, um, but also the most important situation in, in uh, the most important uh, thing you need to do here is create calm. And, um, and then that simple communication. Um, and I guess the communication thing in medicine, one of the things I struggled with going back to medical school um, later in life was that I'd already established my vocabulary for my, for my research. Um, on how to explain things and to come back to a to an environment that was you know hundreds of, of very specific thousands of very specific medical terms um, that um, medical people um, understood and mostly only medical people understood and then having to convert that to language for a patient I actually found quite difficult so I like simple communication um, I, I still struggle with a lot of the medical terminology um, I just go straight for the simple stuff creating calm and that breathing situation, the breathing uh, techniques is important. Um, so this is a, um, 
this is a, a, a pretty big incident that I was involved in in Colorado in 2013. Um, there was uh, flooding in, I think it was September 2013, that ended up stranding about six and a half thousand people in the mountains. Um, and this involved so many people and so many dimensions. I think that the important thing to say up front here is that that this is a such a dynamic situation of of in so many different so many dimensions that uh, the what what you need to take away from this is that you, you're never going to have control in this in this environment, um, or you're never going to feel like you have control. And so the day one of these floods, it was a really wet summer. Um, the ground was completely soaked, so everything was all the rain was running off the ground, not not being absorbed. And there was two low pressure systems that came together and were basically stationary over Colorado for about three days. So the first hints of trouble was at about 10 o'clock on this particular night when um, uh, the mountain rescue headquarters had some minor flooding. And then by about an hour later, there were calls that a car had been swept away in what was usually a very small creek and a house had collapsed and there was one person trapped. Within the first 12 hours, we had 15 of our, my colleagues out overnight um, searching for, um, for you know, uh, the, the people in those incidents. And by sunrise, we had knowledge that there were three canyon roads that were cut off, five towns were isolated. By lunchtime, one person had hiked out um, from one of these towns um, across, the, across the hills saying that this, the town had been completely wiped off the map. And by afternoon, there were at least 40 rescuers in the field. Um, by nighttime, we knew there was six and a half people, six and a half thousand people stranded without power, medical care, some without food, water. The military was involved, hundreds of firefighters in the state of emergency. Now, just talking about this right now um, is making me a little bit stressed just thinking about it. But if you have a think about that situation, about how many people are involved in this within the, the course of 24 hours. On day two, we had 70 mountain rescuers uh, standing by or in the field. There was another 50 on the way. And a lot of, a lot of my, uh, my colleagues and myself, we didn't get back to our homes for three days after that first night. So we didn't know if our houses were damaged, if some people's families, were they okay um, and how they were going. Then there was 10 time critical rescues um, involving um, swift water highline rescues. There was body recoveries. Um, and so hopefully this picture, the picture I've painted here is one of, of complete mess um, that you just don't know what is coming next, uh, but you know there's a lot of people impacted. And so if you think about the psychology behind this, the big red flag here are, are people coping being you will be in this situation people will be overwhelmed and who who are those people it's the people who are stuck in the mountains they may not have they may have their insulin may have been lost away they are uh, washed away medic they don't have their medications they might not have water they can drink um they've lost their their home of you know their uh, of of decades they may have lost family friends um and now there are rescuers who haven't haven't been home for three days there's you know, military helicopters flying around, there's police everywhere, you know, this situation is, is overwhelming. And so um, what, what needs to happen is to be able to pull, uh, pull all these big components apart and, and look at them as an individual piece. So essentially doing um, an, a, a regular assessment of all of the dimensions are you in danger? Are the people around you in danger? And you have a look at that 10 minutes, 15 minutes later. What resources do you have? Have you just lost resources because it started to rain again? You don't, you can't stay dry. Do you have communication? You know, um, is, are things calm? So you have to do these assessments on a regular basis. You have to do them thoroughly and you have to try and predict what's going to happen. Um, so this assessment is the most critical thing. In this situation, you need to maximize the good because so much of this, there is, is, it is no good. Um, and so how do you maximize the good or the positives in a situation that is obviously stressful? Um, and the most important things you can do 
are utilizing the resources, utilizing the the um, uh, you know the people around you. So involving people in their own their own care, their own rescue, giving people jobs to do, giving people regular, timely, simple updates. No information is still information in in these situations, um, particularly in remote areas or um, in in these you know stressful. Uh, rapidly changing uh, environments. And you've got to ask people to invest in the plans um, that they may not have too much input into. Um, one of my good colleagues in Colorado, she talks about the good idea fairy. We've all got a good idea fairy sitting on our shoulder, giving us good ideas, saying we should be getting these ideas out into the world. Um, but un unless unless your idea is critical to the safety of someone or the efficiency of it, then it's quite often the best thing is to just let that, uh, let that good idea slide. Um, in these situations or in any situation, if you're, if you're coming to us into a scene where you may not have the full picture, it's really important to just lay, uh, you know, hang back until you can, um, until you can get a complete picture. So you've got to invest in what is present. Um, and, you know, it's a bit of psychology on yourself to say, you know, unless it's a safety issue, uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to um, hold back until I, uh, you know, can see if I need to make a contribution. And so throwing back to the model of psychological first aid in this situation, it's all about assessment. It's assessing the individuals around you, the group, um, and assessing your environment on a regular basis. And again, creating calm. Um, in this situation, it was really difficult. That calm part of it, it was, it was one of the most difficult things. Um, and then communication again, um, very, very simple, uh, but timely communication. So the final scenario, this is a little bit more locally for me on Ben Lomond um, in Tasmania. It's absolutely amazing national park. It's about uh, 45 minutes to an hour drive from um, Launceston, the nearest city. Um, and it's a beautiful drive. You get to the base of the mountain here and you have this beautiful uh, road called Jacob's Ladder, which takes you up to the ski hill. Now, it's a very primitive ski hill. Uh, it's not the best skiing in the world. The season's um, about maybe three months long. Sometimes it can be really, really amazing with wombats and kangaroos bouncing across the snow. Other, other years, it can be, um, it can be pretty dry. Um, so, but it's enough to keep this, the ski skills going until I can get back to, uh, get to New Zealand or Colorado or, or Japan for some skiing. And as mentioned, I'm uh, on the ski patrol uh, up there for this ski hill. And so this incident happened last year at the end of the ski season. Um, a 56 year old lady was, she was skiing, but the, the rope toes um, were not running. It was right at the end of the season. Um, and she was up there, she had skinned up um, and she fell and broke a leg. Um, so the ski patrol was on the mountain. Um, we were cleaning up the patrol hut, cleaning up the mountain. Um, but um, we, uh, our contract with the National Park Service is to provide ski patrol only when the toes are running. And so when this skier broke a leg, her friend reported to a park ranger who refused to allow the ski patrol to uh, gain access to the patient, to treat her and to evacuate her down uh, to a waiting or to an ambulance. Um, so um, in this situation, um, it would have been possible or so she, she was actually left sitting in the snow for three hours while um, the, the slower response um, was, was organized between police and ambulance. So she was in pain. She had no isolation from the environment. Ski patrol wasn't allowed to go to, to go help. They ended up utilizing uh, two four wheel drive ambulances, four paramedics and a helicopter um, for a situation where within 15 minutes ski, there was four ski patrollers, analgesia, splinting, evacuation tools, and a warm patrol hut. And so three and a half hours later, a helicopter came in and got her. Um, and that could, she could have been easily evacuated to an ambulance within an hour. Um, so in this situation, um, uh, follow up to this is the patient, I believe, is suing the state government for pain and suffering and psychological trauma. Um, 
so the patient needs in this situation in that wilderness environment were not considered um and 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 the 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 main issues in that situation was not understood by the person who was in charge and so in in medicine we were all trained very very uh well um to follow specific procedures and guidelines and that works for you know 99 of the time in the wilderness that changes quite significantly it can often change the priorities that we have for providing medicine um, and and often doesn't doesn't work that well within the standard kind of bureaucratic structure of of, of things and so in this situation you know you you need to be prepared to advocate utilizing your wilderness medicine knowledge um, to do things a little bit differently so you need to be an expert in normal medicine you need to be an expert in wilderness medicine and then you need to be an expert in the wilderness and that expertise i'm not saying you have to be able to you know climb el cap without ropes um, or you know be you know the most amazing you know orthopedic surgeon but your expertise that combination in those three areas um, is critical to combine into into the, the the big picture so i guess in this situation the red flag would be if you're in a wilderness medicine setting and you have some person who's proclaiming an expertise in one particular area that's a bit of a red flag for me um, you you really have to utilize the resources um, around you of the people that you have um, and, and to not take a, a, an individual approach. So um, you need to combine the, the, the knowledge of those three areas to get the best outcome. And so it's essential to, to advocate um, for, for the, that different way of doing things um, for some people who may never have had the experience um, in that. And so the way I look at this is, is leading from behind. There's an incredible book um, written about Mandela's lessons in leadership. I believe that's the name of the book um, where you basically gathering, gathering some or, or encouraging consensus discussion, identifying people's strengths and weaknesses. And through that, you can massage uh, your, the desired pathway. Um, so the people who are doing out there doing um, believe they're doing it um, for a greater good, but, you know, uh, and for the and for the group, but you've actually got a few people, one or two people at the back who are who are leading the direction um, very very subtly and respectfully. And so the wilderness can very easily become scary when things go wrong, and that 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 fear can lead to a focus, which may eliminate um, some some options, um, the best options you have in difficult situations. So go, flipping back to the psychological first aid model. Again, we're assessing the individual. Um, in this case, uh, it's the assessing the individual who's supposed to be in charge and supposed to be doing things right. Um, and so once you've assessed that, obviously in this situation, there should have been communication to say, this is an inappropriate pathway for the, the, the best care of this patient. Um, and it's, you know, about communication again and it's it's being respectful it's it's utilizing the skills that you have to to get the outcome uh the best outcome in the, the that wilderness environment okay so um they're the scenarios that i've painted for you hopefully it's given you a picture of how it all fits into these psychological first aid models I'll go through those very, very quickly and then just have a, a quick chat about a few other things. So again, with a the danger, there's the physical danger that's caused the problem, um, or it may have been a psychological, um, it may just be stress of an expedition um, that is building up, that is creating the danger, but you need to reestablish safety, remove physical dangers, protect from additional stress and reducing chaos. And this is more referring to that very initial period, the first few minutes, the first few hours um, of, of just calming everything down. And that might just be grabbing hold of someone, you know, giving them a hug or, or you know, making things, you know, um, making things a little bit, um, a little bit uh, more palatable to be in that situation. So the assessment, which is a really important part of this, um, you need to assess uh, the casualty the environment and the group and you need to assess, assess sorry assess where they are on that uh, traffic light spectrum 
And this, uh, this information comes from Dr. Kate Bashir here in Australia. Um, she's um, uh, developed this, this model um, that is being applied quite, uh, quite extensively. But assessing the individual for what happened, how, do they, how are they feeling and, and how, you, um, how do you rate their level of distress? Basically, you've just got to put people on whether they're green, they're yellow or they're red. Um, you know, what happened? You know, is it a snake bite and they're freaking out? That's probably reasonable. Um, or is it a, you know, a stubbed toe on a trail uh, and, and they're screaming their heads off? So um, then looking at how someone might be responding to it um, in terms of how they appear, are they frozen out? Do they, you know, are they, uh, is it, are they, are they just unable to walk because of what they've experienced? And so putting an individual on the, 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 the green, yellow or the red is important. Um, and it's important to know you may need to reevaluate as, as we discussed in the, um, the flooding scenario, you may need to reevaluate quite regularly, um, uh, you know, where the person is at. Assessing the environment, where are you? How far are you away from help? How far are you away from being able to get onto a road? What resources do you have? Food, water, shelter, communication. And then what are the communications like? So um, putting the environment into a green, yellow or a red. And then assessing the group. You've got your casualty, you've got your environment and, and now you need to look around you to see how your group is responding. Um, look at the resources you have within that group. And so um, you might have some people who, you know, don't have a great deal of, of, of medicine experience and they might be freaking out a little bit. So you need to communicate to them to say, look, we've got the medical stuff under control. I really need you to go and, you know, build a shelter or whatever it might be. And so you, you can take control of, of where individuals in the group are on that stress spectrum as well. So we talked a lot about communication. Um, you need to build relationships. You need to engage people. You need to uh, maybe involve them in their own rescue. You need to take their, their mind off things a little bit um, and reminding them of the strengths that they have, their past experiences, issues, you know, difficult situations they've been in, um, but certainly don't ignore or isolate the person. And that's an important thing on an expedition, actually, that last point. Um, if you're on a long expedition, you don't want to click to form because someone has made a mistake and broken their arm or whatever it might be. You don't want to start um, encouraging or allowing isolation of an individual to happen. Otherwise, it's just going to lead to disaster. Um, and maintaining and communicating hope. Um, it, it's, it's one of the most common factors that come out of, um, uh, of survival uh, type situations. There's a great book called Deep Survival, and the most the most important message that comes from that is just believing that you're going to get out of that situation of those crappy situations. So creating calm, you create calm. You've got to calm yourself first. How do you do that? Um, you know, you've got to you've got to look at the skill set you have, the people around you, and um, what you can do. Um, what's going on? What is what options do you have? What possible things can you do to help? Slowing communication down, talking slowly, making eye contact, and the breathing side of things is really important. Taking a few minutes out to take uh, those five and a half seconds breath in, five and a half seconds out. Um, and finally, um, evaluating for the evacuation. Um, if your assessment of all of that situation is green or if it's yellow, and your psychological first aid is successful, you may not have to evacuate, um, but you do need to ensure the next phase um, has options. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then you need to evaluate if, if your assessment is red um, or if it's yellow and your psychological first aid is unsuccessful, you might need to evacuate. And everything else, basically, you just need to make sure that uh, after the, the situation, after you're safe, is to make sure you get people to the information and the help that they need. So coming up to the end now, um, one really important thing to note is that in these situations, the effect can go on for a long time. This is a photo of me just after I put an unfortunate rock climber's body into the back of an ambulance. Um, one of my very first rescues in Colorado. It was an absolutely horrible scene, but um, and it, it, it still goes through my mind on a regular basis. But what makes this 
um, so memorable now is the connections that I have with the people who are in that photograph um, behind me. I've talked to those people on a regular basis, even still about this particular rescue. So these things don't just have an impact at the time, um, they can go on. Um, and it's all about, it's all about um, talking it through and processing it and making sure that, um, you know, the, what you've seen and what you've done to help is put into the context, uh, the appropriate context. So I just want to thank um, two people in particular, Laura McGladry, she's with the University of Colorado and the Responder Alliance um, and Kate Bashir. These are both two incredible women who are doing amazing work with psychological first aid for emergency services, people in the US and Australia respectively. I've both had um, incredible help from them. And, you know, the hundreds of people that I've, I've, I've been on rescues that have needed rescue that have taught me all of these things. Um, so there's been some incredible experiences related to the mountain rescue work and being in the mountains. And that's why we were all here. You know, we obviously have some connection with the wilderness, with the environment and um, with our skill set, we can actually make really big contributions. Um, and so that photo there on the left is myself and, and two of my good mates on a practice in El Dorado Canyon. Um, if you ever get the chance to be involved in mountain rescue, please, please jump on it. It's it's probably the best residency for, for wilderness medicine you can get. And the best residency for keeping yourself calm and keeping others calm lies within this book. Um, I'm recommending this book on a, probably two, three times a day to my patients in, in family medicine. Um, I won't say any more about it. I think we're running out of time, but this book is absolutely essential. Grab it, read it, um, and it'll change your life. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Leck. That was so interesting. Um, I'll pass it over to Owen to field the Q&A. If anyone has any questions, feel free to toss them into the chat. Yes, so I do have a couple questions uh, to start. Uh, any advice for people who are considering a career change to medicine later than typically? Uh, and how did you do this? All right, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so my, my career change happened because of mountain rescue. I, I kept finding myself the first rescuer on scene to some pretty messed up situations. And um, I seemed to thrive on it despite, you know, the craziness of it all. Um, and I realized I was better at, I was better in those crazy situations than I was sitting in an office writing research papers. And so um, I had three really good friends that went back to medicine in their early forties. And I just had that example set that it was possible. Um, and that, that time, that time is going to go by whether you like it or not. Um, the most incredible part of medicine is that it's a skill set that will pay you well, will help you travel the world. People, it'll, it'll, people will pay you for your, your, your skills to travel the world. Um, and you get to you get to learn incredible things and and help people along the way. So the benefits that accrue from a career in medicine um, are worth it, um, even if you're starting at 38, like I did. Um, it's a big step, but uh, it's a. Um, I, I think it's. I think it's a, a step that provides rewards that will just keep giving. And one of my good friends who's in South Africa, when I told her I was going to go back to study medicine, she's a doctor. She said the most, the most amazing thing about medicine and that what you need to realize is that potentially every day of your life, you will be involved in someone's worst day. And that's an absolute privilege. Um, and if you do that in the hospital, if you do that in the mountains, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it is, it's an absolute privilege to be able to do that. So, um, the rewards you can't begin to imagine. Um, and I think that if you've got the inkling of it, you've got the resources, you've, you've, the time doesn't matter. All right. Thank you so much. I have another question. Um, so are there any evidence-based predictors of unsuitability for long expeditions? Um, look, there's ex expedition, I, I guess if I use the things like Antarctic uh, research, 
Um, the Australian Antarctic Division has well-established um, screening protocols um, for, uh, you know, for expeditioners. Um, one of the most recent evacuations that happened from Antar the Australian Antarctic Division um, required, uh, you know, multiple countries and, you know, helicopters and planes and, um, and in the media, no one knew what the evacuation was for. Everyone thought it was for medical concern um, or physical medical concern. It ended up being a psychological concern. So these screening tools, you know, are well established for things like, um, you know, these big, exp uh, you know, uh, research expeditions. Um, but they still don't, they don't, they don't, you know, they're not hundred percent effective. So yes, I think the, I think there's lots of, I couldn't point you to the evidence base of the research papers as such, but there's, there's definitely, um, uh, definitely those tools available um, and they can easily be applied and sort of scaled down from the research expedition type down to um, more smaller expeditions. So um, I would encourage, I guess the best resources would be in those, you know, like the Australian Antarctic Division or, you know, Raytheon who provides, um, you know, uh, people for the US um, Antarctic programs. All right. And I have a couple questions from chat as well. Do you work for an adventure travel company as a physician? So the adventure travel company that I'm with, um, Inspired Adventures, it's a volunteer position. Um, the, uh, you know, if I, so that trip to China that I did, that was a 10 day trip they pay for everything from me leaving my door um, to getting back. Um, and the, the really good thing is with that, I'm a, I love, I love photography when I'm out in the wilderness. And so in those trips, I'm getting paid or I'm getting a free trip to use my medicine skills and to carry my camera. And I may not be, I may not be hiking or doing this, this stuff at the level that I'd usually do it, but it allows me to slow down. Um, and to, to take, to take photos. So, um, so some, some, some adventure travel companies do, I know, um, but it's, I think it's a rare thing, which I think is actually a shame because they're, they're getting a pretty good deal. All right. And I have another question. Um, this is an interesting one. Do you, or do different gender ratios of groups affect the cooperation and success of the expedition? Oh, that's an awesome question. Um, and I, I guess I will answer it related to not necessarily expeditions, but related to the mountain rescue work. Um, as you could probably imagine, mountain rescue would, you know, attracts some usually males, usually A-type personalities. Um, but in my rescue team, there was probably maybe 25 to 30% women. And they were the ones I trusted the most because um, they, they, I, th I think I don't know how to I don't know how to answer this without potentially stepping on some landmines, but it was it it, it seemed as though they the, the women in the team had the ability to 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 just slap down that A type testosterone type um, chest beating that happened at times, um, and it was actually more often than not the most important at the most important times of rescues um, that. I think it was sort of a, a calmness and, and an ability to communicate through um, sort of the adrenaline and the, the stress that was building up in people. Um, so I, I'm a firm believer in, in that, that we all, you know, have, have things to powerful things to offer. And my experiences are that the women in our, in my, in our, in the, the rescue team I was with provided some of the most valuable skills um, on that psychological side, in addition to um, the, the the physical abilities, so I didn't see any difference in in the ability, the physical abilities on the rescue team, um, and I saw significant differences um, with the psychological side of it. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, but definitely a definitely a, a good one, and I, I yeah, I have some pretty strong beliefs on that for sure. Right. And as well, is there a recommended way as a provider in the wild to prepare for the psychological hardening required to be successful? Yeah. And that's, that's something I spent a bit of time 
thinking about because I did want to say that I don't proclaim to be an expert in psychology. I, I don't proclaim to be an expert in wilderness medicine, but my it's my experiences over the last, you know, the, 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 the decade of mountain rescue that made me in hindsight realize that the psychology was such an important thing. Um, I think the most, I, you know, if you, excuse me, if you do a, you know, an, adv an advanced pediatric life support class or, or advanced life support class, they teach you about leading, um, leading that resus resuscitation scenario. And as a leader, you need to be able to stand back and, and make a full assessment. And so practicing, practicing that taking a step back, I think, is really important. Um, I think, I think in, when you're finally in a situation, when you're in a team of people, actually up front communicating with people and say, look, I really would like you to let me know when I'm getting, I'm getting caught in the weed, you know, lost in the weeds. Um, if I'm getting stressed out, can you walk up to me and put your hand on my shoulder and look me in the eyes and tell me that I'm, 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 you know, walk going down the wrong path. Um, and, and I think actually being in that book that I recommended the breath book, uh, they talk about how voluntary exposure to stress um, allows you to give flexibility in your, in your body so that when you're unconsciously subjected to stress um, that you, you, you deal with it better. So being out in the wilderness in crappy weather, um, being at altitude, you know, by choice, uh, you know, being out in these environments and exposing yourself to a, the next step up in stress levels, um, I think is probably a really important way to do it. So exposing yourself to the stress deliberately before you are un unknowingly exposed. All right. Well, that is all the questions I have at the moment, unless anybody has any last minute questions for Dr. Lack. Yes, I have one more. Uh, given your experience with climate research, do you continue to engage climate work as a medical provider or rescuer? If so, how? Um, yeah, so one of the projects I'm going to be working on um, when I finish my um, residency is actually looking at how climate change is impacting mental health in, in rural and remote areas. Um, that, um, that project is just starting to, starting to sort of uh, uh, form uh, in how it's going to look. But, but um, yeah, so the, I guess the... Um, I guess the first thing I should say is that my climate change career at, towards the end got, it was pretty, de, it was a de dejecting experience because the science would, would never be listened to at that high level. Day to day now with every patient that I see, um, if, I, if I see a hint of interest, then I'll engage people in that. I'll use that knowledge and, and just ask them, you know, how they feel about what's happening in the world and, and slowly you know, maybe a bit of that leading from behind, like give them a little bit of a, a, a tap just to, uh, and a little bit of the knowledge that I have to, um, to make them, you know, sort of think about things as subtly differently, but you have to be careful by doing that. Um, and, and yeah, so uh, in terms of utilizing that going forward, um, one of my goals is to become a, an expedition doctor on a research ship to Antarctica and give lectures on climate change and wilderness medicine and take photos and rescue people. So combining all of my uh, experiences. Um, and so, you know, there's, there, there are different ways I've thought about doing it, but um, definitely once I finish residency, I'm going to be looking at, um, uh, at that, those research projects on, on how climate change is impacting people's mental health because in reality um, people can't people can't provide people can't invest energy into thinking about you know the future in 20 years if they don't have their health their health if they don't have the bandwidth to do it and so I think that's that's where uh, it's critical for 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 doctors to be able to give people confidence that they're med we're going to take care of their medical medical issues uh, and then actually provide guidance and provide um, powerful endorsement of, of uh, change for the long-term health of people and the planet. 
Well, that is all we have and questions. Um, thank you so much. And I'll hand it over to Catherine one last time. Yeah, just echoing Owen, thank you so, so much, Dr. Leck, for joining us and sharing your experiences with us. And thanks to everyone who joined us this week. We hope to see you next week. Good on you guys. Take care. Thank you so much, Dr. Lack, and thank you everyone for coming. Have a good rest of your evening and morning, I guess. Yeah. Bye. See you, everyone. Take care.